This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. The wonderful truth of the gospel offers the greatest freedom there is. As Jesus Christ promises in the Bible, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Yet today, there's a powerful social movement advancing a sinful agenda that's enslaving people and robbing them of the freedom God intends for them. On today's program, we'll expose the radical homosexual political agenda and we'll bring you a story of an innocent young girl who was besmirched by activists simply because she affirmed that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Plus, we'll offer a resource later in the program that will help in the long run to get us out of this mess. And I'm John Sorensen, president of Evangelism Explosion International. I'll be back later to tell you how God can forgive your sins, whatever they are. There's no more controversial issue in our society today than homosexuality, but our opinions need to be informed by the Word of God rather than popular sentiment. As we begin, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy takes a biblical look at homosexuality and offers God's transforming power to those entrapped in it. In his message, Entertaining Angels Unawares. And now may we turn in our Bible to the 19th chapter of Genesis, chapter 19, verse 1. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, and called unto Lot, and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand, and pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And may God speak to us today through this, his ancient word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. An ancient story, a modern problem. In fact, one of the greatest moral, spiritual, and social problems of the last several decades. I refer to the problem of sodomy. And to the story that we read today, wherein the city of Sodom gave its name to live in infamy in that perversion of sodomy, or as it is called today, homosexuality, or the gay lifestyle, if you prefer. 
And of course, I trust that the details of it are fairly clear. You recall that God said that the wickedness of Sodom uh, had come up to heaven and that he was going to destroy the city. And God, Adam, Abraham pled that he would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And if there were 50 wicked, he agreed he would spare 40, 30, and down to 10. Apparently, there were not so much as 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom. And so the city was destroyed. You remember that the two other angels appearing merely as men, the other was actually the Lord Jehovah in a theophany, an appearance, brief appearance in human form, came into Sodom at evening. And uh, Lot, who was sitting at the gate, Lot had chosen the fertile plains that surrounded Sodom. It was the garden of God, as it was called, a place of great abundance and leisure and wealth. And he was sitting at the gate and uh, Lot offered to these gentlemen to uh, come into his home, to wash their feet, to rest, to eat, and rise up early and the next morning. And they said, nay, but we will sleep in the street, here in the square. And that no doubt caused uh, Lot a good deal of concern. And he urged upon them and pressed upon them, no, come, turn into my house. Because he no doubt had seen what had happened to others in that infamous city who endeavored to spend the night in the square or in the street. And so they turned in, he fixed for them a meal and they did eat, but before they could even lie down to sleep, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, as it is repeated, obviously these were infamous men, the men whose doings had caused the wickedness of the city to rise up unto heaven and to determine its destruction. They surrounded the house and they called out to Lot, bring out unto us the two men that came into thee that we may know them. Now it's interesting that homosexuality and the homosexuals which have literally created a revolution in our society and culture have moved into the churches. In fact, they have established a whole denomination of metropolitan churches and they have re redefined the sin of sodomy as being simply inhospitality. Now, uh, these uh, homosexual churches support this by saying that when they said, bring these two men out unto us that we may know them, that they simply wanted to get acquainted. And it is true that the word yada in Hebrew, which means to know, is used exactly like it is used in English in two sentences, in two different ways. It may mean simply intellectual knowledge, getting acquainted with something, learning about something, as we use the word. Or it mean, might mean that intimate knowledge that comes from sexual intercourse. So we read that Cain knew his wife and she conceived, and so-and-so knew his wife and she conceived and bare a child. It is used in both senses, just as we use the word. In fact, in jurisprudence in America today, there is something called carnal knowledge. And that's the same kind of use of the word. But they say, that's not what it means here. It simply means they wanted to get acquainted with the people, get to know them. Just like I invited you to go over to the fellowship hall after this service and get to know some strangers, meet some new friends. But what did Lot say? He knew these men. And how did he respond? I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. <laughs> if they just want to get to know them, what's wicked about that? I mean, can you imagine me saying, now I know that some of you are planning to go over to the fellowship hall and get acquainted with some strangers. Do not so wickedly. That's absurd. And so all of their logic and their twisting and resting of scriptures is absurd, but they deceive the gullible. Those for whom the wish is the father of the thought easily fall prey to them. Not only did Lot know what they were going to do, but the, the men of Sodom themselves knew what they were gonna do. Listen to what they say. They say, this one came to sojourn among us and now he would be our judge. Now we will deal worse with him than we were with them. That doesn't sound like they just wanted to get acquainted. My friends, the teaching of scripture could not be clearer. I remember 20 years ago, 
Somebody asked me if I thought that was a sin. I said, friend, if the Bible does not teach that sodomy or homosexuality is a sin, it doesn't teach that anything is a sin. It could not, in my opinion, be any clearer than it is. Well, what is their response? Anyone who says that homosexuality is a sin, they simply say this person is filled with hate. Hate. They are a homophobe. They hate uh, homosexuals. What should be the attitude of a Christian? They, we are to love them. For 2,000 years, it has been the Christian position that we are to love the sinner but hate the sin. And I don't hate homosexuals, nor can you. And let me say this. Our study in 1 John makes it abundantly clear. We can't hate anyone. If we say that we are the sons of God, a God who is a God of love, we can't hate people. Vengeance belongeth to the Lord, not unto us. We are to love the sinner, though we hate the sin. I've known homosexuals that have come out of the homosexual lifestyle. I've known those that are struggling in their efforts to try to overcome it. I've known those that are in it and want to stay there. But I have prayed for them all. And so must we. Uh, these are people who are desperately in need of our prayer. But of course they would have people believe today that they can't be set free. That it's something that they're born with. There's nothing they can do about it. Well, my friends, nothing could be further from the truth. The Guttmacher Report, which came out just recently, and Guttmacher was ahead of Planned Parenthood, no friend of evangelical Christians by any stretch of the imagination, but his study showed that 1.1% of American men were either homosexual or bisexual. 1.1%, and listen to this. Another study showed that 2% of American men claimed that at one time in their life they had been involved in the homosexual lifestyle, but no longer were. America is being conned, dear friends, and the consequences are serious. Sigmund Freud said that if you remove a public prohibition against homosexuality, it will tend to increase in any culture. That's exactly what we have been doing and what we are doing. May God give us the wisdom to wake up while we have time. May we pray. Father, open our eyes, we pray. Oh God, save this nation, we pray. Change the hearts of people. Open the eyes of your people and help us, we pray, oh God, to deliver this nation back to thee. For Christ's sake, amen. Friend, the scriptures tell us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is not one that is righteous, no, not one. If you know Jesus as Savior and Lord, you understand these truths. In today's message, Dr. Kennedy spoke specifically about the sin of homosexuality. But sin is anything that displeases an all-holy God. Whether your sin is homosexuality or heterosexual sin or lying or stealing, sin can be forgiven at the foot of the cross. Jesus paid for your sin and for my sin. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you in need of God's forgiveness today? If so, I would urge you to pray with me right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of men, I confess that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness and cleansing right now. I ask you that you would enable me to turn from my sin and live for you from this day forward. Help me, I pray, in your matchless name. Amen. 
I hope you prayed that prayer, and if you did and sincerely meant it, then let me be the first to say, welcome to the family of God. You have begun a relationship with the greatest friend that you'll ever have, Jesus Christ. To help you grow in that relationship, we want to send you Beginning Again. In this book, you'll learn how to pray, how to read and study the Bible, how to stay right with God, and much more. To receive Beginning Again, please write to us or call our toll-free number. God bless you as you do. At one time, tolerance meant letting the other person have his or her view, but tolerance has now been redefined. As Dr. Kennedy just explained, in today's milieu, the militant homosexual agenda demands approval, despite what the Bible says about it. In the current cultural climate, what happens when an innocent person simply expresses what the Bible teaches on marriage. You're about to meet a courageous young lady who found out to the point of receiving death threats when she dared to speak out in favor of biblical marriage. She learned the hard way that today's so-called tolerance is applied quite selectively and unequally. One viewpoint in particular gets singled out for intolerance, the Christian viewpoint. Let's take a closer look. Sarah is our middle child, and the name Sarah means princess. I like to play the piano. It's nice to be able to play songs I like, and I love to read. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered We like together to read the Bible together and eat dinner together. We're a very close family. My daughter got interested in the pageant when she read about it. Her eyes started sparkling and her eyes lit up and she said, I think this is something I'd like to do. When I get up on stage, I just feel totally at home and I just love it so much and it's really fun. Our local pageant system uh, is a scholarship pageant. They focus on leadership qualities public speaking, confidence with that microphone in there, confidence in who you are as a person. And last year she was able to earn the crown for her division. I was so excited. I actually started crying on stage because I worked so hard. My husband and I feel very strongly about bringing our children up in a Christian environment, in a Christian home and building a foundation of Christian values in their life. Thank you, Jesus. We always have family dinner together. Uh, I like to make that a discipline. One night at dinner, my mom was talking about when the Senate was meeting, because she was going to testify. We found out that the date of the public hearing on the marriage redefinition bill before the Maryland State Senate Committee was going to be on Sarah's birthday. Any person is allowed to testify on an issue in the Senate. And I was always kind of like, oh, that would be cool to go do that. So then I realized it would be my birthday that year, and then I decided I really wanted to do that. So she got on the computer, and I was really pleased with what she came up with. And it looked to me like what you'd expect from a 14-year-old girl, that mother, daddy, Every child should have that. It's my birthday kind of sweet innocence. I remember just thinking how thrilling it is that we have this democratic process in America that everyone can have their say. I went to testify with my friend, my good friend, and her mom. My daughter testified the same day as Sarah, and it was a long day in which we were waiting for their turn to testify. I was very nervous right before I went up to the podium. The podium was kind of tall, so I felt kind of small standing in front of it. So I just kind of reached deep inside me and pulled out my pageant smile and got confidence from that. Hi, I'm Sarah Crank. Today is my 14th birthday, and it would be the best birthday present ever if you would vote no on gay marriage. Sarah's testimony was very sweet, much like she is. She wanted to share with the people there that day how precious she thought marriage was. People say that they were just born that way, but I've met really nice adults who did change. 
So please vote no on gay marriage. Thank you. She came home and said, Mom, there was somebody who asked for my name after it was over and said that he might put me in the cassette paper. And I thought, okay. Before I went to bed, I went ahead and went online just to check to see if they had posted anything. Her testimony had been put up on a blog and it was beginning to gain already a lot of attention. <laughs> what I saw was an outpouring of hatred towards my daughter, such as I would have never thought possible. There were thousands and thousands of hateful, negative comments on these multiple blogs. We were immediately started shielding our daughter from the profanity, the curses, and the, every now and then the death threats that were popping up. And some of the news, news coverage, the actual coverage from commentary writers, were, were outright direct attacks on my daughter. Why would somebody react like that to the thoughts and words of a 14-year-old child? How have we arrived at this place where a simple statement that you're in favor of traditional marriage is seen as hatred and bigotry? Now come to this conclusion. We're dealing with an organized group of folk who have an agenda, and their agenda seems to be to force real acceptance. It would have never occurred to me in a million years that they would think about publicly attacking a child. When I was alone, I would kind of think about it. I think they didn't like the fact that I had an opinion at all. They started a website trying to advocate that the county take our kids away from us. They were uh, claiming that because we're raising them in a Christian household, that we, it is child abuse to teach them biblical teaching on morality. How do you respond to that? Sarah testified before the legislature in Maryland about uh, marriage and that uh, marriage should be between a man and a woman and that kids should have a mom and a dad. And as a result, the, uh, the homosexual community just began to unleash unbelievably vicious attacks on her, even death threats uh, to a 14-year-old girl simply because she said that kids should have a mom and a dad. Very troubling when you consider freedom of speech, freedom of expression, today only applies to those who walk within the lines of political correctness. Number one accusation against my daughter is that she's a bigot, that she has somehow decided she's going to hate this entire group of people for some reason. You look at her testimony, there was nothing there, no condemnation, no judgment whatsoever. Yeah, I testified because I just love my family and like I said in my testimony, I just want everyone to have a mom and a dad and have such happy life that I've had and well-rounded and everything. Without question, what you see happening is every time someone stands up to speak, they are targeted, they're marginalized, uh, they're demonized, and they're threatened, and it's all designed to silence them. If we allow ourselves to be chased out of the public square, then we will lose. There is no loss when you're a Christian if you're doing what's right. When we do the right thing, it will often result in persecution. Sarah Crank is a young girl who gives me great hope for America. You know, we talk about how we've lost the younger generation. I don't find that to be the case in totality. What I've actually found is that we've got a generation of young people that are more committed to the truth than my generation ever hoped to be because they've been tested by fire. This whole experience has really changed me and I kind of have gotten a little bit more confidence in myself, you know. I, my opinion can be heard too, even though if I'm just a 14-year-old girl. I can change things. What a courageous young lady Sarah Crank is. Yet how far have we as a nation fallen when we're forced to approve lifestyles that God prohibits and might find ourselves on the receiving end of death threats just for voicing the traditional biblical view that's held sway for thousands of years?
Some of the most accurate studies show that about 3% of the population claims to be homosexual. Meanwhile, there are tens of millions of professing Christians in America. Yet so many Christians don't seem to show up at the polls and vote. Or if they do vote, they don't vote in a way pleasing to the Lord. But we have a new resource that we believe will help. The Bible doesn't tell us who to vote for, of course, but it does provide clear principles on moral issues. And many times those moral issues are on the ballot in terms of where the candidates stand. But do you know what the Bible says? Perhaps no one in our time did a better job explaining the biblical perspective on subjects like abortion, on homosexuality, on socialism, and other issues tearing our nation apart than Dr. Kennedy the founder of this ministry. We've compiled a seven DVD series of his messages called, How Should We Then Vote? It includes the full length message that you just saw a part of on this program. For a limited time, this DVD set is yours for a generous donation of any amount to the ongoing work of this ministry. Please write to us at Box 6084, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll free 877 877- 962-7677 or go online at truthinaction.org. This series is also available on audio CD, so let us know which you'd prefer. And we've also put together a brand new book to help you with these questions as well, called The 2014 Biblical Guide to Voting, which is also available right now for your generous donation of any amount. This short book provides a guide to a biblical perspective on more than 20 current issues. It presents them in clear and easy to understand language and explains the biblical principles that undergird them. You'll definitely want both of these resources in time for the election in November, so contact us right away. Please write to us at Box 6084, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-962-7677 or go online to truthinaction.org. Be sure also to go online daily at truthinaction.org for our 40 days of prayer for the election. Make sure you go to the polls on November 4th and vote. And we ask you to cast a ballot for this ministry by making a generous donation, whether it's for 60, 70, or $100 or more. Thank you for joining us and may God bless you as you stand with us. And may God bless America with a new national awakening. Today's program is available on DVD or audio CD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. Next week on Kennedy Classics. Socialism is the equal distribution of poverty. The narrative is control and power. That's socialism. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.